Fantastic, great stuff. Um, so yeah, very big and, and very broad uh, topic. And, uh, you know, as we've heard from John there, we're living in quite interesting times. I think if nothing else, this is going to be a test of the nation's domestic broadband. Um, so I just thought I'd start uh, with the classic bingo uh, for anything involving any kind of Zoom or, or web conference. Um, so if anybody wants to screenshot this uh, and see how many of these we use, uh, loud, painful, echo, child or animal noises, hello, hello, uh, or I think there's a lag. Um, hopefully we won't have any of those this morning, uh, but if we do, then uh, obviously bear with us. We've got a couple of fail safes and, and fallbacks. Um, so to start this uh, proposition, I, I thought it would be useful because I imagine a, a few people on this uh, conference aren't necessarily familiar with who we are at SILIP. Uh, we're the professional association for people working in libraries, information and increasingly knowledge management. Uh, so our members work as embedded information professionals uh, in around 20 industry sectors. So everything from you know, public libraries, schools, academic, uh, through to government, um, security, health and uh, uh, corporate sectors and a number of others. And the thing which unites all of our work with all of those people is this fundamental belief in the power of libraries, knowledge and information to change lives, uh, we hope for the better. Uh, so our work centres on uh, supporting our members, uh, hopefully supporting them as much as challenging them, but thank you for that, John. Um, we like to provide education, CPD uh, and training to help people develop their skills, future-proof uh, this profession and indeed to act uh, as an effective advocate for the profession. <coughs> In case people aren't familiar with uh, where we came from, uh, we actually formed as a campaign group back in about 1827, uh, campaigning for local councils to be able to lift uh, the penny tax, which was holding them back from funding universal free public libraries. So uh, it took the thick end of 100 years, but eventually uh, that campaign was successful, which led uh, into the flowering of public libraries across uh, the UK. And then from around 1885, we became the professional association for people working in all types of library um, and i suppose one of the reasons why i wanted to kind of focus in on that is our ideas uh, about the future of libraries are very strongly rooted um, in in the past in their ideas of where they came from the purpose uh, that in essence libraries and information services have been fulfilling for uh, you know decades um, hundreds of years uh, and so it won't surprise you i have a copy of the minutes of our first formal meeting in my office. Uh, the two first items discussed at our first ever meeting were the low pay and low status uh, of librarians in their organizations. And so here we are uh, a couple of hundred years later and um, you know things haven't necessarily uh, changed. But a lot of my thinking about the future of libraries centers on this proposition from Rolf at uh, the uh, Center for Citizen Services and Libraries in, in Aarhus who said the library was never finished because it was never meant to be finished. Uh, his vision, and it's one that I, I really firmly uh, believe in, is that what we're doing here is a, a permanent and ongoing process. It's a process of evolution and change. And that uh, as soon as libraries become a fixed point, uh, something's gone wrong. So we need always to be open to, and in fact, it's gonna be the theme of a lot of what I'm going to talk about this morning, uh, to this idea that we are engaged in an ongoing process of discovery, unlearning, relearning, change and adaptation. Uh, because I think, you know, the way we navigate today, as John says, uh, and the way we navigate into this uh, near future is absolutely contingent on our ability to embrace change uh, very much as a constant of what it means uh, to be a library. So I think going back to the, the kind of origins of this proposition, one of the things that got me involved uh, in this sector in the first place, I was doing some work for the State uh, Heritage Agency in South Africa, uh, looking at the history and origins of uh, libraries uh, in some of their township communities. And one of the things that really struck me is that for as long as there's been something that looks like human civilization, there's been something that looks like a library. Uh, so the need for trusted access to quality information in a format and a location to meet people's needs is, I think, as old as the history of humanity. And I think the process that we're engaged in when we think about the future of, of this fantastic sector is that each generation 
has to look again at the contemporary challenges and opportunities uh, that confront our users, you know, the, the wider society that we serve, uh, and to decide how we configure that function to meet those current and future needs. And so the great expertise of the librarian to me uh, is in taking the ethics, the knowledge, the science of information, and using those to configure the library uh, to meet the changing needs of the communities and organisations uh, that we serve. And I think one of the things that's most exciting about doing this for a living is that we are unquestionably living and working in the early days of a society that is being daily transformed by knowledge, data and information. And that's transformed uh, for the better, transformed in some ways for the worse. Uh, and so how do we as this generation of librarians and information professionals think about how we configure our <coughs> systems uh, to adapt to those changes? And I think what we've seen, you know, what we're seeing at the moment with coronavirus, what we've seen in recent conflict zones, uh, what we've seen kind of throughout the history of disruption and displacement in the world is that people build libraries as a vital part of rebuilding their lives. So even now there are mobile libraries touring the coasts of uh, Greece and Italy and other places serving displaced migrant communities. Uh, in Darfur there are UN libraries of peace serving communities that were torn apart uh, by civil conflict. And so I think yet again what we have with COVID-19 is an example of how libraries, librarians build resilience and facilitate the flow of knowledge and information in a way that is going to be fundamentally important to help us recover socially and economically. And I think one of the things we're seeing at the moment with the response to coronavirus is everybody is occupied with transition uh, into home working, transition into uh, what may be a number of months of doing things in a fundamentally different way. The question is, how do we do that as effectively as possible? And then how do we make sure that we recover as quickly as possible? So libraries throughout all of those processes of displacement and conflict have always acted as places of trust, of safety, uh, places to find information, places to connect with community, a place of reconciliation, as we saw uh, very much in the world in, in South Africa, uh, a place to find solidarity, uh, a place to support education, and just generally uh, to find support. Uh, and I think what one of the facets of what we're doing as a, a generation of, of librarians, professionals, people leading these services, uh, is learning that we have to treat uh, the physical and the digital just the same, that success can equate to an online engagement on equal terms uh, as somebody walking through the threshold of our organizations and I think it's taken us a long time to understand uh, that those values can indeed be equal. But the thing I, I take a great deal of comfort from, I sometimes get sort of existential questions about, you know, uh, will there be libraries in the future, what, what's the shape of these things? I think this simple human need is absolutely likely to persist, whatever behavioural shifts come about through technology, economic change or, or even global pandemics. So I guess the question for me is not will there be libraries, it's how successfully we can adapt libraries uh, and there are some real challenges for us in that which uh, I'll, I'll touch on some of them in just a moment. So we do quite a lot of work on foresight and analysis, we are taking a sort of 20 to 30 year view uh, on the future development of the sector. As John says, it's very hard to pass next week, but um, you know, planning, failing to plan is, is of course planning to fail. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time with you this morning just exploring these eight uh, themes that we see are, are really going to define the future that our services are needing to be configured towards. Um, so the first is demographic change, understanding the changing attitudes and behaviors of our users, uh, the period of political adjustment that we're going through, uh, the clear environmental uh, and climate change imperative, uh, ongoing technological change and what that means for management and leadership, uh, this idea of finding alpha, um, how we address the bottom line of our organisations, and then uh, one with which I'm sure we're all familiar, uh, navigating our way through information overload. So just to explore the first of those, um, despite you know what's going on at the moment, um, which is of course incredibly scary uh, for a lot of people. I think uh, it's important to be clear that what we're looking at over the next 10 to 20 years is very significant population growth in the UK. 
Uh, and so the UK population on, on current forecasts is estimated to grow by three and a half to four million people. That's five to six and a half percent. Um, so we'll be passing the point at which we have uh, a population of 70 million people somewhere around 2029. And that demographic change is being driven by a combination of lower mortality, uh, increased birth rates, people living longer, positive net migration. Uh, and those things are largely unaffected by uh, recent political events and indeed the, the current situation. But I think the real issue is that we are not building resilience into our infrastructure. And so we are mostly managing our way through institutions, services, infrastructure and housing that were conceived in the post-war era for a maximum threshold of 60 million people. Uh, we're going to be around 70 and growing. And so there is a clear need to configure our infrastructure to deal with more people. And I don't know about you, but I don't think any of us has an infinite budget to keep growing our staff uh, to manage services that are going to be in greater uh, demand over the next 10 to 15 years. And so it has to be about some of those principles that John touched on to do with working uh, smarter rather than having more people. Uh, but we ought to be building knowledge infrastructure alongside the physical infrastructure uh, that we're focusing on at the moment, because our future as an industrial kind of industrial economic nation is unquestionably going to be uh, structured around knowledge, data and information. So alongside that uh, demographic change, we also see a change in people's attitudes and, and behaviours. So. Um, I highly recommend the Euromonitor trends uh, around user attitudes. The 2020 analysis is, is starkly different from the analysis of just two or three years ago. And it's very clear that there are now generations coming through uh, into voting age, into uh, work, um, that are bringing with them a, a whole different set of values. So just to explore some of those themes, we're looking at um, AI uh, being embraced both by the consumer in terms of convenience, and by businesses to integrate uh, into their technologies to automate operations and increase personalization. But we're also learning that no matter how sophisticated your algorithms, no matter how deep your neural net, uh, the principle of crap in, crap out still stands. Uh, and so even the most sophisticated AI are really only as good as the training data sets that we're able to present them with. And that does raise a number of ethical concerns. If we're forging ahead with AI in a way that is not accountable, um, that is based on data that isn't necessarily accurate or which reinforces inbuilt biases from the past, um, then there are very serious ethical questions for us to confront about the pace at which AI is becoming um, just a natural part of the operating environment. This principle of catch me in seconds, the consumer intention, you know, we, we already know any of you that are old enough to remember the kind of early days of the web that in theory sort of had an eight to ten seconds to capture somebody's attention and um, that process the kind of shortening attention span uh, really means that we need very concise very relevant and multi-sensory content that can be processed in an instant and so how do you take the immense content and capability of your organization and resolve it down to a piece of snackable content that's going to grab somebody's attention alongside Instagram and Snapchat. This idea of friction that John touched on uh, earlier is, is really key to the thought process of, of today's consumers. So the rise and rise of personalized and frictionless transport, the kind of Ubers of this world, is I think indicative of a general unwillingness to deal with broken process or to deal with greater friction in a system um, than, uh, than we can manage to engineer out. There is a, a key uh, area around inclusivity, diversity, representation, and so there's clear evidence that consumers are increasingly looking to authentic, relevant brand experiences that speak to diversity and equality. Uh, and we need to consider how we're building those things into the content we deliver, the services uh, that we provide. This one, number five, is, is really interesting to us that um, we think increasingly in future people are going to be moving uh, fairly seamlessly between different uh, information contexts. So rather than being at home, at school, at work, at the gym, you'll be uh, working from home, shopping, exercising, relaxing, learning, um, that really what we're looking at here, and I think the uh, self-isolation and social distancing that comes alongside coronavirus is really interesting in pushing faster in this direction. 
uh, is that a lot of brands are reshaping their offer around in-home consumption. So how do we support a user uh, where they are rather than where we are? Some of the other elements I think really importantly for us as information professionals, private personalization, so consumers rejecting brands that mishandle personal data, the idea um, that actually how ethically you treat user data is a key part of their trust in your service and their belief in your brand. Uh, we're seeing more people going from global to local, reframing the offer uh, around the increasing demand from consumers for authentic local experiences. Um, so how do we couple that to the kind of very large scale processes we're going through around content aggregation, distribution, syndication into an experience that feels local and curated and as though somebody cares about the experience that you're having. The rise and rise of the reuse revolutionary ethical consumers actively rejecting single use products uh, and particularly plastic packaging. We had a, a great session uh, with BIC as part of the virtual London Book Fair the other day, uh, looking at how we can take uh, the book supply chain and green it. Um, and the key element there, the, the, the greatest criminal of all, seems to be cellophane uh, and plastic packaging on books and pallets <coughs> as they're distributed around the world. Uh, and then this really interesting emerging trend around the recognition that access to clean air uh, is a social justice and equalities issue. Um, that a lot of the disadvantages of the modern world target the poor disproportionately. Uh, and so how do we make sure that there is equitable access to the benefits uh, of all of this technology and innovation? Then I think just distilling all of that down, this really key insight, and I think if there's one theme we as libraries have to respond to in, in this future uh, that's coming at us fast, it's this, convenience and personal control are the core themes connecting these trends in 2020. Consumers are putting themselves first as they look for ways to simplify their lives. And so very much in keeping with the theme of today's session, if we have an end user uh, that needs maximal access to quality information on demand in a way that they can depend on, but in a way that is simplifying their lives, then we've got a lot of heft heavy lifting to do in the background to make sure uh, that that can happen. We are unquestionably, I think, going through a period of political and economic adjustment. I remember talking to uh, Jacques Attali, who was the director of the World Bank around 10 or 12 years ago, who said uh, we were about to watch wealth uh, move away from the West and towards emerging economies in the East, um, and that we were going to tear ourselves apart in the process. And in some ways, he hasn't been entirely wrong. Uh, according to the IMF, the UK remains the sixth largest uh, world economy. We are still, uh, I think it's the ninth largest producing economy. Um, service sectors in the UK account for around 80% of the workforce and 70% uh, of our overall economic activity. And I'm very fond of saying that there isn't one pound of our gross domestic product that doesn't go through the library. You know, any element of our industrial strategy, innovation, growth, skills, all of that starts with access to knowledge and information and the literacy and skills to make use of it. But that strong position is masking some underlying issues. A poor trade deal could shrink GDP. There is an issue with persistently low productivity, um, that the poor are around 1.6% poorer than they were five years ago, whereas the rich are around 4.5% richer. Uh, and so the equality gap uh, is widening over here. There is then this really interesting uh, rise around ethical consumption um, that around 81% of consumers globally believe strongly that businesses have a responsibility to implement uh, green programs. Uh, very interesting disparity though, one recent study found 65% of consumers indicating that they buy green uh, when actually only around 26% of them actually do. So there's a a risk that we're virtue signaling around uh, the eco agenda rather than doing uh, real kind of fundamental change. But I think there is clearly a key role for us as libraries and information services, both in modeling uh, environmentally accountable behaviors in our own work, but also in educating the public around sustainability and climate change. I was talking recently to the leader of uh, an academic library um, who described leadership today as managing your way through a, a series of incomplete S-curves. Um, and, and what she meant was really that we are 
never going to find, I think, a position where one generation of disruptive technological change has subsided to the point at which it's safe to get on board before the next one uh, comes along. So this kind of perpetual beta in terms of technological change is a, a huge challenge because I think many people in the sector are looking for certainties, you know, when are we going to reach the next safe harbour? Uh, and as the head of a, an NHS trust said to me recently, um, we used to lead from point A to point B, uh, but now we've taken everybody away from point A and we have no idea where point B is going to end up. But I think a key behaviour in libraries that uh, I would really love to see us embrace is courage and curiosity. Um, that instead of freaking out every time a new technology comes along, every time think we think this is a sort of existential crisis about our purpose and role as libraries, uh, instead of doing that, we look at it and say, great, let's have some of that. Let's learn how to make use, use of it. Let's learn to be the bridge into our organizations. Uh, because this process is not going to change. Uh, and I think the more we can help our organizations take advantage of the, these technologies in ways that are uh, you know, safe, ethical, uh, scalable, uh, then the more central our role as librarians and information professionals is going to be uh, in that program of change. We talk quite a lot, uh, we do a fair bit of work at the moment in the financial services, legal and, and uh, transport engineering sectors, funnily enough, and we started hearing this phrase uh, increasingly in those sectors and it's starting to make its way across other things. This idea of finding alpha, which is the ability to extract uh, a leading edge, competitive advantage through insight and analytics from the same data sets uh, your competitors are using, whether that's structured or unstructured data. So in a world where you know marginal gains on insight from your data and information can make a fundamental difference to your organization, uh, we need to be clear on our role as librarians in helping people really maximize the value that they're able to extract from their data. So we've seen examples of finding alpha in, in health, uh, looking at uh, improving identification of heart disease mortality, um, we've seen it in one case in a local authority where they found alpha by um, dramatically improving their ability to uh, recognize the indicators of domestic abuse in the data systems that they have and to target interventions accordingly. So finding alpha isn't really about more complicated algorithms and speaking to John's uh, kind of challenge at the beginning about how we navigate this future. I do think it is fundamentally about going back to the basics. It's about ethics and structure and cataloging of the information because I think the way we're going to find alpha in uh, a library collection, in our data sets, in our information is by making sure that that information is managed, discoverable, well described, well structured uh, and reusable across a range of contexts. This one I find really interesting that the the bottom line of organizations is changing. So speaking recently with a, a group of hedge fund uh, managers, they were looking at these three heartbeats. So there is the chaotic movement of money markets at the moment, obviously the kind of global impact of just the past uh, seven to 10 days. Um, there is underneath that an ongoing trend of technology driven disruption. So, uh, you know, new companies coming into an established market and disrupting it. But the biggest rise, albeit it's still a very small overall share of global trade, is environmental and social good, is about socially responsible investing. So in this environment we're in, where increasingly trust in your business is a currency, I think the role of ethical information professionals in structuring knowledge systems and structuring experiences to speak to uh, that ethical concern is, is absolutely vital. And then finally, this, we you know, you know, I mean, information overload has been a concern for most of the last 20 or 30 years. We know that it occurs when the amount of input into a giving system exceeds its overall processing capacity. So we're dealing uh, at the moment, we're working with Network Rail, uh, who are digitizing about 23,000 kilometers of railway infrastructure. I usually get asked at this point whether that's going to make the trains run on time, which I'm not entirely sure. Um, but what they're looking at is moving from you know, a fairly manageable data set to petabyte scale data emerging from a railway that is empowered with sensors and smart devices and having to build the human infrastructure to manage 
the scale of that data. And so I often think we make a mistake by positioning libraries as competing with search, whereas I think what we're really competing with is the AI driven tools for metadata description, enrichment, curation, discovery, selection, and indeed recommendation at scale. So some of the themes that, that kind of emerge for us as a profession, uh, we know change is the new constant. Our skills base has to adapt. You know, we, we can't afford to go to library school, get a skill set and then go into work. Uh, we have to learn, unlearn, relearn on almost an ongoing basis. But ethics are central. There is a central role for our services. We have to be environmentally accountable. We have to be uh, better around the diversity and representation in our own workforce. Uh, but critically as well, I think we need to be able to focus on convenience, immediacy and agency as the attitudes and behaviours that are really going to help us navigate into this future. So I think the Library in the Future is going to meet a lot of these challenges by balancing out these four elements. There's the element of developing the skills and literacy of our users. There's an ongoing need for access to quality books and information, a curated collection. There's an increasing and, and developing and changing need for digital connectivity and resources. And then there's a need for events, activities and experiences to drive engagement. And as I say, I think the real expertise of the librarian looking into this future of ours is going to be one, uh, how we configure those elements and two, how we develop the facility and agency in our users to make the best use of them. So I'm going to run very rapidly through how some of those changes are impacting on uh, a couple of the sectors that we're working in. In schools, we're seeing a, an increased focus on the school library as a learning commons or a digital space, but also a real need for the school librarian to help users navigate issues like uh, information literacy, fake news, uh, critical thinking, developing those skills uh, in, in learners. We're running a campaign called Great School Libraries, which is absolutely about repositioning the school library as a, a centre of education in an increasingly technology enhanced way. We've obviously got the changing and emerging role of their fee supporting a very wide range of, of learners in different contexts and the fact that we have an increasing number of people doing things like academic degrees through FE and colleges. In public libraries we have I think a really remarkable story of innovation uh, but one that risks being choked off by the current political and economic environment for local public services in general. Uh, which is why we're working very actively with local governments to try and change that picture. In universities and research, we know libraries are still very highly valued for their impact. We know about increased specialisation around things like RDM, scholarly comms, uh, alongside those more traditional uh, librarian roles. But also this really interesting theme of how we can use data better to be more accountable in the information that we aggregate and share with those users. So for me, the agenda around decolonization is really an agenda around the redistribution of who gets to decide what information gets shared. In health, working as part of the TOPOL review, looking at how health librarians um, can power things like genomics, uh, new approaches to personalization in healthcare, but also protect some of those principles around things like uh, patient privacy and how that data can be used on an aggregated basis, but in a way that still protects the individual patient. Corporate libraries very much evolving and adapting uh, their role, moving towards business market intelligence, <coughs> KNIM, <coughs> taking on a role around things like acquisitions, contracts and licensing. So really, I think what we're uh, looking at here in terms of the library of the future, and I'm just going to sort of draw to a close over the next sort of 30 seconds to a minute or so, just to assure the organisers, um, is a really fundamentally important ongoing process of change and adaptation. So around a year ago, we asked thousands of children across the UK to build their library of the future out of Lego. Uh, they did some beautiful things with it. We saw some very imaginative uh, creations, things like a book teleporter. Uh, we saw some brilliant ideas about this idea of the library of the future as a platform for users to come together to express themselves, discover knowledge, create new ideas. So I thought I'd close this, given that we're talking about the library of the future, by sharing the top 10 uh, things that the uh, youth of uh, today uh, asked us to see. This is what they built in their libraries of the future out of Lego. Green energy, 
to power the library, robots to assist the librarians, not to replace them, uh, a lot of book sorting drones. There's a real desire to see drones in the library. Uh, we love the idea of retro bookshelves for future hipsters, um, but also a lot around things like parking for carbon neutral, neutral hypercars. Uh, a lot of people will be traveling to the library on their hoverboard. Uh, the great immutable fact of coffee and Wi-Fi, which seems to be a key feature of the future, even for children as young as seven. Um, the idea that the library would have an e-history machine, which allowed you to recreate the experience of walking with dinosaurs, virtual reality, a garden, uh, and most importantly of all, of course, in all libraries, a secret door. Uh, so I think we can learn a lot from that about how user expectations of the libraries are going to be changing uh, over the next 10 or 20 years. But I return finally to that quote, the library was never finished, it was never meant to be finished. This is absolutely about how well we respond to change and adaptation. So to me, the library of the future will be whatever the users of the future need it to be. Uh, and with that, I draw to a close. Thank you so much uh, for including me in today and I'll hand back to our organizers. Thank you. Nick, thank you so much. Um... For, uh, there's, you know, there's so many thoughts running through my head having listened to, to that. I mean, I'm just thinking, I think it was the Greek philosopher Heraclitus who said that the only, and the only thing that endures is change. Yes. And I think, you know, that's self-evident however many hundreds of thousands of years later, that's still one of the big challenges that we face. We've had lots of very interesting questions that have come in. They kind of touch on um, ethics, they touch on the physical landscape of, of libraries and how that's changing. Um, they touch on, um, you know, how librarians have responded to, to, to technology and um, AI. And that. I'm not going to ask any of those. Um, I, I, what might be good into the future if we collate those, Nick, and if you're happy, so maybe we could have a blog where you're able to respond to those questions mm -hmm. um, via text. I've got one quick question. Do you remember your first library card? And can you remember the first book that you took out of the library? I can. It was, this is a really irritating story. Um, so my mum was a, a, a school teacher um, and so she took me to the library next to her school um, and I went in and got the library card with her and uh, I was precocious brat essentially and so I think I was seven and my first book was stories for eight-year-olds um, yeah. and so I was very proud of reading uh, that book but I remember it being a completely amazing experience. And in fact, that library is still there. I go back fairly uh, regularly. One of the interesting things, I mean, I think you get a library card before you get your national insurance number. I mean, it's, it's the first signifier of the right to a world of knowledge. It's the first thing that you're granted. And, and as a, a sort of rite of passage, I think that's incredibly powerful um, that you're given this, this card that signifies you, you own that world of knowledge. You have the right to gain access to it. Thank you so much.